Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Build Room. Today we're going to continue working on the 1976 RA23 Celica and what we're going to do is cut a little bit of the rust out that gave it that nickname Violet Crumbles. So let's get into it. Now before we just jump into cutting up the car, some of you guys have given me some feedback that you'd like to get a bit more information on the tools that I'm using and the products that I'm using as we go through this process. Now I'm more than happy to do that, but there's two caveats there. Firstly is I may not have the best tools or the best products for the job, but they're what I have and the things that I've accumulated over my time working on cars, so hopefully you get some value out of it. Uh, and then secondly, just a reminder that this is only the start of my channel, I am not sponsored or paid to do any reviews in any way, shape or form. So this is just my honest opinion of the stuff that I happen to be using on the projects that I happen to be doing. So if we start with the biggest piece of equipment that I'm gonna be using today, that would be the welder. Now there's a bunch of different types of welders out there. You've got oxyacetylene, you've got stick or arc welders, you've got MIG welders, which is what I'm gonna be using today, and you've got TIG welding as well. And there's probably a couple of other ones out there like spot welders and um, a few other different ways. But basically, welding is fusing two pieces of metal together. Whether or not you introduce a filler metal while you're doing that is uh, depends on what you're doing and the type of welding that you're using. But basically the reason I have a MIG welder is because they're very much a easy to use general purpose welder that can do everything from sheet metal welding, which is very thin and delicate, all the way to quite heavy welding with very thick materials and needing very deep penetration. There's probably methods that you can use in all those other types of weldings to get that same job done, but they require a skill set that I don't have and time of mastery, which is um, uh, really important. Like So TIG welding is probably one of the the best types of welding that you'll hear people talk about for working on cars and doing pretty much anything. It results in a very clean and neat weld and you can do things that you just really can't do on a, a MIG, including welding really thin aluminium and stuff like that. So you can get a spool gun that will enable you to weld aluminium with a MIG welder, but it's not, not gonna have anywhere near the precision and the final quality of finished product that a good TIG welder would do. But TIG welding is a lot harder to master. And as I said, I haven't had the time to get into it. I'd like to at some point, but right now, the MIG will get the job done for what we need to do today. So let's have a look at mine. Okay, so this is my Lincoln 180C MIG welder. So MIG stands for Metal Inert Gas, which basically means that when I'm welding through the handpiece, it has a metal wire, in this case, copper wire, which is the electrode that touches the piece to create that welding arc and it uses an inert gas to shield the weld so that it doesn't corrode as it cools down. So this welder does also have the capability of welding without gas using a fluxed core wire, but using a flux core means you need to use a little bit more power for starters, which means you're more prone to warping panels. It also spatters a lot when it welds, so it's not quite as clean. Now this is a 180 amp unit, as the name would suggest. It does require a 15 amp plug, and that's something to consider when you're buying a welder. They do consume, this is 15 amps at 240 volts. A standard GPO around your house is just a 10 amp, 240 volt. So you do need a special plug for this one. If you drop down the amperage in some of the ranges, you'll get away with just a 10 amp. One of the main reasons I went for this particular welder, I think it runs about $1,300 nowadays, which now is a lot for a MIG. Uh, when I purchased it, there was only a few brands that were available around me in Perth, and I wanted something that was good, and I particularly wanted something that had, if you look here, uh, there is a significant adjustment available for the voltage. Other models only had sort of four different settings for voltage. And you'll see when I'm welding, I think I'm only going to need the bottom quarter of the dial in terms of voltage uh, on this car. So I wouldn't have had very much adjustment at all and probably would be easily burning through the material or uh, not getting the penetration that I needed. So it's also a fairly compact unit, which is good because I don't have a lot of room in the garage. So if I open it up, you can see that it will house a full five kilo spool. Uh, you can get smaller spools if you're only, this is a fluxed core inner shield wire. That wire is about 50% thicker than this copper basically to house that flux, but you can put these smaller spools on there without a problem. Now, aside from that, there's two other things that I really like about this. 
First is that it gives you this easy reference chart so you can look up the gauge of the material, the thickness of the wire you're using, the type of wire you're using, uh, and then it'll give you a guideline on the, the feed rate and the voltage you should be using. It's a good starting point. The second thing is it also has NASCAR performance so you and your cousins can enjoy it. Now, it's sitting on a custom-made stand. This is basically the equivalent of Jedi's making their first lightsaber. When you buy a welder, I highly recommend the first thing you do is build yourself a trolley for it. Uh, most likely, it'll cost you more to build that trolley than it would to buy a cheap one from Super Cheap Autos or something like that, but you do get the experience, which is invaluable. So on the back here, we have an E-Class cylinder of BOC's Argo Shield Light. This is a mix of argon, carbon dioxide, and oxygen designed specifically to shield welds. Now, I would highly recommend not wasting your money on such a large cylinder, unless you're gonna be welding nonstop. So cylinders this large, you can't actually buy in WA, you have to rent them, or at least you did when I got this set up. Now, as I said, that was 10 years ago. This is my first bottle of shielding gas, and I'm only just getting to the point now where it's about to run out. So you can get smaller bottles from Bunnings and some of those other welding supply places. So I'd recommend if you're just getting into this for your own car and that, start off with a small bottle before you make a commitment because I have paid rental on this for 10 years and it is probably the most expensive bottle of Argo Shield in the history of mankind. So last but not least in your consideration should be uh, protective equipment. So this is a auto darkening helmet. I recommend auto darkening. This only costs sort of $100, $125, I think. But if you have a helmet that doesn't auto darken, it's really hard to, uh, at least when you're new, place the electrode near the work properly. Uh, on top of that, I'd recommend you guys get yourselves a reasonable apron so you can protect your clothes when you're welding. Ask me how I know that. And also a good set of gloves. First time you ever do a really neat weld, your lizard brain is going to tell you, now that you're really proud of that, touch it to see how smooth it is. And I guarantee you that's gonna end up with you in a world of pain unless you have a reasonable set of gloves. So don't skimp out on those. So other than the welder, there's a bunch of other tools that we're gonna need. And the first one is the angle grinder. So this is a five inch grinder. It's probably the biggest grinder that I would recommend for doing this kind of work. Because you're gonna be working in confined spaces and things like that, you don't want a, a giant seven inch grinder or anything like that. Bigger is not better in that case. So a four inch will do the job. Uh, I just pick a five because it's a little bit more versatile when you're working on other things. But generally speaking, you're cutting through sheet metal in tight spaces, so you don't need a big grinder. I have a cordless. Uh, I find it really handy, so I'm not tripping over cords and that. And it is a DeWalt because most of my tools are DeWalt. There is a heavy religious war, uh, at least in Australia, around the difference between DeWalt and Makita, and that's lots of fun to wind your mates up about. But in reality, brand here isn't that important. The reason I have DeWalt is because uh, all my battery packs need to be the same to uh, be able to be switched between products. So this is actually a, um, this is an 18 volt tool, but it's actually a 54 volt battery pack, which is meant for my um, uh, Recipro saw and a couple of other tools that need a lot more voltage than a standard 18 volt pack will do. But these packs are actually convertible. So when I plug it into an 18 volt tool, it goes from a 54 volt with a, I think 1.2 amp per hour to a um, 18 volt with six ampere hours. So there's plenty of capacity in here to grind for a long time. Um, and because I have a lot of uh, cordless tools, I have a lot of battery packs to swap out anyway. So cordless doesn't bother me. But basically any reasonable small grinder will do the job. If you're buying tools for longevity, that's a different story. And I like my tools to last a long time. Um, I think my DeWalt tools, I started buying them about 15 years ago and I still have some of those today. So I think I've only ever had one DeWalt tool fail on me in that entire time, and that was a small 9.6 volt uh, nickel metal cadmium battery uh, drill. Realistically, that was going in the bin anyway because those batteries didn't match these newer lithium ion batteries. So, so yeah, my thoughts on DeWalt are that they're worth the money, especially for me that I have so many other tools in the ecosystem. Uh, but you know, there's plenty of other good quality uh, tools out there that your average do-it-yourself can do that are gonna cost you less money. So on that grinding, there's a couple of things that we're gonna use. The first is just cutting discs. Now, I've got a really thin kerf cutting disc here. Uh, the kerf is the, the thickness of the disc. Now, the reason I have these thin discs is because they obviously, they remove less metal when you're trying to cut through something because they're thinner. Uh, but that also means that they create, they create less heat. So you're less liable to warp panels and they also cut faster. So yeah, if you're cutting through sheet metal, just get the thin kerf ones. You can get cutting discs that are about probably 
two to almost three times this thickness. They are a little bit cheaper, but they're not really worth that saving. So the one thing you've got to remain vigilant on with these thin curved discs and really any grinding whatsoever is to make sure you leave your guards in place. Don't take them off. You see everyone doing it, but the problem is these things spin at, uh, I think it's somewhere around the 10,000 RPM mark. Yep, so this is, this is 9,000 RPM. So you're spinning this disc around at 9,000 RPM and it shatters. The pieces come off with significant force. So have goggles in, even if you wanna wear a full face mask, that'll stop you getting little bits of metal flicked at your face and things like that. So um, yeah, just really take your protection seriously when you're using this stuff. Uh, the other thing that we're gonna use is a flat disc. Now, this is a ceramic abrasive disc. It's a 40 grit. Now, that's very coarse and really only suitable for taking down uh, the welds and this sort of stuff. Don't be tempted to use these to remove a lot of paint. If you do, you want to do it very quickly because they create, again, a lot of heat, right? So the reason there's a, lot, a bunch of different things to remove paint from surfaces, especially chemical stripping and things like that, is to stop putting heat into panels. When you put heat into panels, you run the risk of that metal expanding under heat and warping. All right, so you wanna keep heat out of panels. So that pretty much covers off the majority of the specialist tools that we're gonna be using today, other than drills and small hand tools and bits and pieces. So let's get stuck into the car. Now, the area that I wanna focus on for today's episode is that passenger side uh, inner front wheel arch. The reason I chose that is because there's two repairs in there that I think that you guys will get value out of seeing. Firstly is a complicated area of rust on the strut tower that involves a lap joint uh, and the removal of some material. So that'll be an interesting one. And then the second part is that repair that I think is from someone trying to drag the car with the tow hitch. So we're gonna fix both of those today and I'm gonna try and give you an in-depth look into what it takes to get that done right. So let's get cracking. Okay, so if you remember in last week's video, I talked about the rust in the strut tower. So we do have a little bit of rust all along here and it's basically there's a, a lap joint uh, there which has got moisture in it at some point and rusted away. So the complexity here is that sure I can cut along here and cut down either side to take that out and replace it but I also have this piece of metal to consider and the rest of the lap behind which I'm not going to be able to get to this side I'm going to have to get to from in the engine bay. And the rust there is not insignificant if I just turn the light off for a second. You can see through there, we're just basically seeing the light from the other side. So there's definitely a little bit of work to do there. Bringing the light back on, I've also got to fix. The other thing that I mentioned was that this sheet metal here has been pulled away from the chassis rail. I think that's mainly because someone's tried to pull the car with this and they've just ripped that metal away. So looking from the underside, we have a gap there that of about a half inch, I'd say, 10 mil. We need to close that gap up and then weld the steel back together so that it doesn't separate again. While we've got it open like this, we'll also treat the rust a little bit. And the way we'll close it up will be just to drill some holes in the steel from the top here, uh, where the old spot welds used to be, and we'll just plug weld each space. So I'm gonna start on the strut tower first, because I think this is gonna be more difficult to repair, and I might as well do it now before my spirit gets completely broken. So just one thing you can see here, there's rust here and we're gonna be cutting. I've just moved any of the lines around it, so unbolted that, moved it out of the way so I don't damage it while we're cutting. So you can see here, while my lines aren't vertical, they're straight enough. I tried not to cut through this layer from the other side. So we're just gonna treat this metal. I did cut through here by accident, but that's fine. We just run a bit of weld over that and tidy it up. So I've got cuts here and here, and then we've cut all the way along there inside the engine bay. I did come through the second layer a little bit there, but we can fix that up, that's fine. So now I just have to cut a neat line across here and then that will allow us to remove this inner piece of metal, or actually the engine bay side of metal. Then we can weld a patch in.
Okay, so down in the engine bay, this is the back side of the area I cut out. Sorry, I can't get you a better shot, but it's pretty cramped down there. Now, there's some, um, obviously this is rusty through here, uh, but there's also seam sealer or, or something inside this area. So it's not as bad as it looks at the moment. So we need to clean this up and then treat it with some rust converter. I think this one would be okay. I'm pretty comfortable repairing it rather than just trying to cut the hole out and fabricate a new second piece here that would look the same. So the bay is very tight and that presents a problem with cleaning that out. So what I've actually just done is just got my impact wrench and got one of those cheap Bunnings wire brushes, which I had lying around and just put on an extension socket. And hopefully that will allow us to get down there and get enough uh, wire wheeling in there to clean it up. And then we'll spray on some rust converter. Okay, so my spray gun seems to be broken, so I had to switch over to a brush there, but basically it doesn't really matter. You've just got to get the liquid rust converter on and then give it about 15 to 30 minutes to do its magic. Now so we can go and work on some of the other bits. Okay, so we'll start by pulling the uh, bracket off. Okay, now if we're getting closer, the seam is basically bent from this spot weld forward. So what I'm gonna do is just drill a series of holes along here. And then once I've done that, I will rust prep and zinc prime all of the interior here so that we don't have to worry about that rusting out again later. And then I'll hammer it flat and then simply plug weld each of the holes that I drill. And then we can grind it off and it'll be basically just like new. So looking at it, it is making me wonder whether the damage was from someone pulling on this tow hitch um, and pulling this out or whether this has at some point had a knock in the front and it's popped those uh, spot welds open. So when I repair it, what I'm gonna do is repair it from here forward so that as we flatten this out, if it is gonna push the nose out, it'll do it slowly rather than me fixing the welds here and then finding it wants to bunch up and crimp when I get to this point. I am just gonna use the crowbar here just to hold the gap open so that when I'm putting pressure on it, with the drill, I don't start closing it up and drilling into the metal on the other side because I want the metal on the other side to be um, nice and flat and untouched so that I can weld into it. So because the spot welder has heated this metal up so much previously, it's a lot harder. So what I am gonna do is just drill in between. I'm gonna put another one here. I know they're very close, but I'm gonna put another one here just because this is where the bow's the biggest. All right, well, that's gonna walk on me, I would seem. So I'm gonna to have to center punch these. <laughs> Now that's two layers there. So look, cutting through sheet metal, I normally wouldn't bother, but I'm gonna need some WD-40 here just to lube that up a bit. Can never go wrong with a little bit of lube. Okay, so if you saw me drilling along here, I was getting pretty close to this fender here uh, to the point where I couldn't drill this one because I was on so much of an angle, I couldn't get the drill not to wander, um, even with it center punched. I don't want to take off the guard because then I'm going to take off a whole bunch of other things. So what I have done is just put a stepper drill into my impact wrench and that should get us through in a bind. We'll see. Okay, so if we look in here now, I've cleaned out all the really rough rust it's quite smooth in there now. Just got to be careful of those burrs. 
So I have to clean those up with a file. And I'm just going to put rust converter in here now on both sides. But looking at the damage, if we have a look up here, so I was thinking at one point, because this is bowed out so much, maybe it had had a tap on the front end, like a front impact. It doesn't look like that's the case. So if you can see here, all of this is fine. It's actually only damaged once we get to this join here. So if you think about the pressure of something attached to here pulling outwards, what it's going to do is pull this out at its highest point, which it is about here. And as it pulls out, it effectively is going to make this panel shorter, which is going to pull in. So it's pulled in from the front and separated it here at this join as well. So I think once we tap all this out, so we'll rust, rust convert this, we'll put a bit of zinc primer inside here on both sides, and then we'll tap it down flat and just sort of tap it down and then tack weld it and then tap it down and then tack water all the way along and hopefully when we get up here this will close up and then i can just bend this back with some multi-group so it's at a 90 degree angle again and then we should be good to go meanwhile so we just need to get some weld through primer on this on this side it's actually not that important because uh we're going to be able to brush all this back but particularly on the other side of this panel here we need to get weld through primer on the opposite side of it so that once those two panels lap over each other, they are protected on the inside. And then similarly over here, we need to make sure that we get primer inside this seam here. I don't know of a, a great way to seal in these sorts of areas. If you put say a seam sealer or something in here, when you go to weld it, you're gonna torch that seam sealer right so i guess probably the way that i'm going to do this is to put weld through primer inside as much as possible knock it down weld it and then go back and wire brush the outside of it to um just make sure i get any last bit and then do an etch prime and then put the underbody coating on it i may also do seam sealer on the underside of here just to stop any water traveling up i will also inside these holes i will spray as much cavity wax as i can to protect the inside of this bit. Okay, so this is actually starting to move back into place. I'm using a big hammer, but I'm not hitting it particularly hard. I'm just trying to follow where it has distorted and knock those back so it pushes things back into the original place. I mean, this area here is completely closed up now. I can just spot weld that in. These ones is probably, look, not even a millimeter gap. I'll just throw a clamp on those as I weld through and that should bring them nice and close together. I think I might also drill out a hole here at the end and just put another spot weld in there to make sure these are tied together permanently. Okay, so like I said, this is overkill having this sort of um, weld through primer on the outside edge. But the reason I did this is because I think it'll be interesting for you guys to see once we've welded in this, what this primer looks like on this side, which will hopefully explain the relevance and usefulness of World 3 Primer. Okay, so again, that wasn't great welding. I'm still just trying to get a good understanding of how much voltage I need and the wire feed. So I started out way too hot and in here I actually burnt out some of the metal so I turn the voltage down and the wire feed down to compensate but those two look good this last one was a lot easier to do but the world did flow out what i'm gonna do is give these a flap disc back now so i can see what they look like before i just keep replicating my mistakes further down and we'll see if we can tweak this okay yeah so i'm not too unhappy with those this one i think i just turned it down too much and had the wire feed probably still up maybe a little bit too high. So what I'm gonna do is just do another pass over these just to fill in some of these gaps. Um, and then I'll try these through here. Okay, so that, that actually went better then, but there is, I just put too much heat into it. I was sort of rushing through it. I should have let it cool down before I went for this edge here. So if you can see that's just burnt through a little bit. So I'm just gonna fill that up and then hopefully I can grind this one back and it'll look good. Okay, so generally speaking, I think that'll be fairly solid. 
It's closed up. It looks pretty good. These worlds have penetrated to the back. You can feel that they've got the heat through them. They've, they've peeled off all the um, uh, primer and undercoating that was on the back here. So we have got penetration through. Look, it's it's ugly, or it was ugly. I had to grind those welds down a lot. I'm, as I said, I'm not a professional welder. Probably guys on the internet that could have fixed this a lot better, a lot quicker than I did. But I think that repair will be structurally sound. So now we just have to uh, get the flapper disc back on this and tidy it up a bit. And then we'll put a uh, coat of etch primer on there just to protect it until we can get the undercoat on. Okay, so I didn't see this on the first pass, but actually up here, right there, it looks like there's actually some tearing of the sheet metal or at least some, some rust penetration or something. Anyway, there's a few pinholes there. So what I'm gonna have to do is when I weld up this section here, uh, I'm just gonna come back and just touch those points there to put some, fill them up with some metal and then grind them back flat again. Okay, so I've just cut a little strip of metal out. Now, the, the main tip when you wanna repair sheet metal, get metal that is the same thickness. Sheet metal is very thin. It's very difficult to weld one thickness of sheet metal to a significantly thicker piece of metal. You tend to just burn through the thinner piece. So what I'm gonna do is put this in from the back and hold it in place with a couple of magnets um, and then we're gonna attack and just see how we go. Okay, uh, not my finest work, not my worst work. Um, just spot welded all the way along that top line. Uh, down as much as I could through these bits that I cut from the outside. And then I just uh, threw a little bit of weld onto this bit here, um, but it was burning through pretty easily. So I'm just, I'm just letting that cool down. I'm gonna go back and do another layer over that and then grind it back. I'll just turn the power down a bit as well. Okay, so that looks pretty reasonable. And what I wanted to show you on the, um, the weld through primer, the copper primer. So if you were to picture me on the other side of this panel, welding it up, and I've done more damage here than I would have from the other side, and I'll show you the other side in a second, but you can see the, the primer has sort of bubbled in extreme heat areas, but generally speaking, it hasn't caught a light, it hasn't peeled off, and it's still gonna provide an element of protection there. I've literally, just as I've done this, realized that I should have put copper primer on the back of this because now this panel here is unprotected so what I'll have to do there is I will be throwing a bunch of seam seal it down in here so I'll squirt that in first just to basically coat the inside of this metal with seam sealer so it doesn't rust out I should have just sprayed the back of this panel with copper primer as well before I put it on uh, I wasn't really thinking on that one I did weld it in pretty much in in a line now normally you wouldn't do that because it would you'd run the risk of warping the panel by putting too much heat into it. But this is only on the strut tower, so I didn't really need to stitch it and then go back over and over again. And some of the other areas that are a bit more prominent will be a bit more careful. So let's have a look at what it looks like inside the engine bay. Okay, so you can see the back side of the weld here. Um, and you can see the penetration all the way along. It's pretty reasonable. Certainly enough for a non-structural part anyway. What I am gonna do is uh, it'll be, I won't be able to film it, but um, I am going to run the MIG over the bottom half of that to get it all tied in from this side. And then when I do pull the engine, I'll obviously go through and neaten that up anyway. But, you know, for a patch you'll probably never see, um, I think it's a pretty reasonable job. Okay, so I've just ground all these worlds down as far as I care to. There's a little bit in here that's hard to get out, which I could probably pull out with the die grinder, but I can't really be bothered considering there'll be a strut right here, you'll never see it. And I don't, want to, I don't want to make this metal too thin by grinding the back of it. While I was there, I also fixed up those few little holes that we had here. So it's just time for a coat of primer now, and then we can leave those. Okay, so the primer on this bit is now quite dry. What I want to do here now is actually weld in from the other side just so we can see what reaction the primer is going to have 
when we do that welding. Now I know obviously that means we're gonna I'm gonna have to strip this and reprime, but I, I think it's important to see the difference in how the copper primer versus the standard etch primer actually handles the heat of welding. So I'm gonna set the camera up here and you guys can just watch along as I weld from the inside. So that's all done. I think the main difference between this and the copper is just, just see how that flakes off. So if it flakes off that easily, I'm not, I'm not using really any pressure. I'm just tracing this across. I'd use my finger, but it would turn into a blistered mess in seconds. But it is just coming straight off, meaning it's, it's already lifted away from the surface of the metal. And we would then have a air gap between paint and the metal, which water gets in and it's going to hold water and rust this out even faster. The other thing is that you are gonna contaminate the welds with the paint as well, whereas the copper primer, I mean, having copper in the welds isn't that big of a deal. The main difference here is just the point at which the product starts to boil off, if you will. So I'll have to wire brush this back down, but then I can reprime it. And to be honest, that plate now in there is 100% solid. Just give it a real push. Was, it had a little bit of flex to it before because I hadn't welded up this bottom part yet. But now that I have, this is now welded all the way along here and up the sides, just not as prominently as this bit because there's obviously two layers here. Now you don't have to weld from both sides. I kind of did it up the top here just to show you what would happen with the heat. And, I, and even there, I didn't put a lot of heat into it. I was very quick on the tacks and I actually spaced them out the first time through and then went back and hit each one uh, in the middle on the way for the second pass. So, you know, I put very little heat into this panel and this is the state of the paint behind it. Okay, so that's a very wet coat. Um, it's not a long-term uh, coating. Uh, it's just there to protect things until I can get around to doing the undercoat in here and that, you know, Never say never, hopefully this will only be a few days, but uh, it could be a couple of weeks. Okay, so there's a bunch of other areas on the car that need to be fixed up. So there's this sort of stuff, which is on the outer panels. Now I'm not gonna deal with this now because my goal here is to prep the underbody enough to get that new coat of sealer on. So these can wait until I'm repairing the rest of the body. Uh, but these sorts of areas, now there was on both sides of the car, in this area, the wheel area, there is a repair. There's also a repair on the underside that needs to be done. You can just see it sneaking through there. Those will probably be done from inside the car. Now those are not gonna be particularly interesting to see done and they're not gonna offer a lot of value over what I've just shown you today. So those I'll do off camera. However, there is this bad boy, this monstrosity over here that does need to be fixed. now. While I was working on the diff, I made the mistake of touching this piece of what I thought was metal and just giving it a little bit of wiggle and the whole thing snapped off. And if you look at the back of that, that is basically some small patch pieces held together with body filler and silicon sealer by the looks of things. But that, that is absolute garbage and that is not a good quality repair. Uh, the problem being is when you do something like that, what you do is create a really great trap for water which then continues the spread of rust. So now we're in a situation where we have a very complicated area to fix. We have four panels. We have the uh, inner inner guard, if we're gonna call it that. We have the outer inner guard. So there's a seal here and two pieces of metal. Um, we also have another piece of metal that goes up into the boot area, uh, which sits in between these two. And then we have the outer skin. So there's four layers of metal there that need to all be repaired. And just looking up there, there seems like there's a fair amount of rust. So not only are we gonna to have to deal with that, we're also gonna to have to take enough of this skin off to ensure that we can fix what you can't see through this hole here. So it's going to be a little bit like peeling an onion uh, so that we take enough layers off so that we can get to the root of the problem and then build it back up layer by layer until we have 
a quality repair that's going to last a long time. But we don't have time to get into that today, so I think that's where we're going to leave it. Okay, yeah, so while we didn't cut out a huge amount of rust on camera, I feel like the two bits that we did cover are fairly indicative of what we're going to be in for for most of these. And really all that's left is to take on that big monster that I just showed you. So in summary, happy for today and not particularly looking forward to next week. But I would like to say once again, thanks for watching The Build Room and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.